was the presentation into four parts. First of all, I am going to share a little bit about the rationale of the book, the life history of the book, in another way to say that. And then Sarah will introduce some of the conceptual foundations and the way we understand oral history and narrative research. In the third part of the presentation, we are going to give you some hints, some ideas about the structure of the book and share some of the narratives and some extracts from every research participant who joined this project. And at the end, uh, Sarah will be back just highlighting some of the key elements of the afterword written by Professor Rosselke. So at the end, we are really willing to have a discussion with you all and very much welcome your comments uh, or questions at the end of our presentation. So the book is primarily an attempt to put people uh, to uh, the people we do research with at the forefront. For many years, uh, scholars have been working on ideas of home, migrations and mobilities, but very few uh, publications really put the narratives of uh, people at front. So we wanted to consider that as an important issue because why this is the case, why we need just look after big concepts, theories, and discussing all of that and only quoting a couple of years but research participants and then the readers have very little knowledge of who are the people who are inspiring this research. Okay. So we wanted to just change that in a bit and in the homing project that is a project that was um, hosted by the University of Trento uh, and led by Professor Paolo Boca and the people who are part of this publication, Sara Bonfanti, Aurora Massa, Milena Meloni, and myself, we decide to try to use the life histories to develop concepts and theories and to further engage with the discussion about home, mobilities, and migration. But having said that, this is not very kind of a straightforward process, publishing or getting a publisher for this kind of exercise. Because, you know, as an academic and in particular a career researcher, you are expected to really engage with theories and concepts and publishers are really looking for that. So I am now sharing part of the life history of the book that I will frame like a book with a very difficult childhood and a very interesting adulthood, I hope. Why a difficult childhood? Because we have a couple of rejections. We submitted our book proposal, and um, so and three, and then some of them just say anything, which means silence is, I am not interested in your publication. Then we have an opportunity to just write an email to another publisher and they say, no, this is interesting, but no for us. It would be very difficult to find a market for a life history book. But I'm really, really grateful. We discussed this with Sarah before our meeting today. We are also very grateful with those who rejected our book because at the end, we approached the very first uh, publishing house we have in mind, but didn't because we found somehow very um, kind of ambitious. So thank you very much indeed, Berhan and War Emotions in Syria and San Professor Noel Salazar for believing in our project. We do strongly believe that narratives, we can build theory and create knowledge based on the experience of the people we met in everyday life and we have been doing research for years, months or even more than a decade in some cases. So at the end we are in line with Professor Umar Kutari and Professor uh, David Hume when suggesting that narratives are not tales. They can inform the everyday life of people and we can learn from them and build theory and create new concepts. So welcome again. Um, uh, and I hope and this book really create new ideas and new ways to understand the complexity, the relationship between home, mobility and migration. Over to you, Sarah. Okay, so thank you very much. Would you mind, uh, Diana, to, to switch to the next slide, please? So, yeah. So, Luis Eduardo already gave this, gave this general outline of our presentation today, and I'm going to give uh, uh, an explanation of the next one slide, so slide number three, and it's going to be a sort of, uh, let me say, a very short introduction to the, uh, the theory of life history. So in my own, as a social anthropologist, I did, uh, I mean, I don't know how many, I think more than a couple hundred life histories interview. And some of them were, of course, extremely lengthy. Some of them were, of course, extremely, uh, you know, emotionally charged, both for myself and my own informants. And for us, uh, it was specifically, um, it, it was specifically somehow, um, let, let me say, uh, challenging 
challenging to uh, to be able to to choose upon a repertoire of around 200 interviews the the, uh, the sort of uh, the anthology so the best of them the best of them which we we thought would be uh, specifically uh, interesting for our audience uh, i'm not sure this is the this slide i was going to comment on uh, so i think it's the previous one diana no i i, I don't know i I thought uh, we had made another one. Well, that's fine. So I'll stick on this one. Uh, it's fine. It's fine. So, number two is fine. So uh, I'll give you a very short glimpse of what oral history means, meant to us, and what narrative research uh, uh, comes up to in this book. Uh, let me say that for us, I mean, trying to apply the so-called mobility paradigm to uh, to stories of migration as rendered by our research participants was itself uh, uh, a really tough endeavor. So it meant uh, to go back and forth uh, towards different disciplinary approaches, uh, uh, towards what is, you know, scientifically called oral history. So this sort of, you know, method, uh, which is typical to... Uh, to the petite histoire, since uh, you know the turn of the narrative turn in in history itself, but also at the same time to to rely on uh, you know the research method of doing oral histories of collecting oral histories in sociology and anthropology. As for myself, I was particularly enthused a few years ago by a writing by Vincent Crapanzano. Um, who definitely uh, put the accent on how oral life histories are somehow a medium between what experience, what experience in research is and in life is and interpretation. And at the same time, uh, of course, the life history method uh, um, does mediate between the informant and the anthropologist, uh, between what life uh, uh, was before telling it and what life can be once it's being told to a listener and once again, retold by writing to an audience, to a readership like the ones which yourself make up. Um, let me say that in the introduction, uh, which is pretty lengthy to be an introduction to an edited book, uh, we tried to give a comprehensive overview of uh, life history and oral histories as we as we thought of it. So we went through um, the passage from orality to the text. So we try to give an account also of what we we say is our theory of representativity. Uh, we did also some um, we took some import from cultural studies and other disciplines. And I was apart from Vincent Carpanzano, I was also particularly inspired by David Zeitlin. Uh, David Zeitlin commented on uh, life history as, as something which can be compared as a metaphor, as an anthropological silhouette, so which is less complete than a formal biography, but although at the same time it's more honest because of the fragmentness of it being partial. Um, we think that the nine life histories which we are presenting in the book are particularly representative not only of the groups we interviewed throughout the course of the homing project, but also of the possibility for doing a social science research which is specifically, let me say, respectful and grateful to the research participants. Uh, all of us, and this is something that we may comment on then in the Q&A uh, part of this presentation, all of us as uh, not only, of course, assigned uh, a sort of ethical path, a sort of research ethics uh, among ourselves as, as, I mean, researchers, but also with our own participants. And I'm not meaning uh, simply, you know, informed consent, but I'm also meaning the fact that for each of these life stories, all of the person, uh, all the people who actually conducted the day interview were um, were keen to inform step by step uh, their interlocutor of how the story was going to be used, was going to be reframed and retold uh, through the writing mean. So I'm really happy to share with you uh, this sort of introduction. And I really wanted to say that, uh, um, I mean, if we go back even to, um, and I'm really quoting before Geertz here, when, I mean, if culture is metaphorically like a text, I do not see any better research method than life stories to, to be able to account for the complexity of life, for the complexity, especially of mobilities. And especially in these times of, uh, you know, war times, 
virtually across the world, not virtually, honestly, I mean, really across the world, I do think that life stories as a research method can be exceptionally fruitful, prolific, and exceptionally respectful of people and uh, uh, their own private lives. So please, towards uh, the content of the book, uh, so I'm giving the floor back to Luis Eduardo. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, can I see the next slides, please? So the first part of the book is searching for home, focus on migrant um, attempts to make a home in the international space. And it comprises uh, an introduction made, written by Paolo Bocagni and three chapters. Uh, the chapter one that is called Moved by the Hand of God, Lucho, a Peruvian religious minister in Manchester. Chapter two, One Essential Home, Ecuador, another essential home with my mother that is experience of Miriam, written by Paolo. And um, Priya, Home in the Global Market, Life History of an Indian Woman by Sarah Bonfanti. I will share some bits of his life history and try to um, reflect with you what are the key elements or conceptual issues that we are trying to address with this part of the book. Um, this part of the book basically uh, is departing from a basic, but we do believe a fundamental question, what and where is home, and how people uh, on the move experience home. And we are just trying to understand how the process of moving from one place to another, people may struggle to feel at home, in particular at the beginning when they just settled in a new place. But we are also very much aware that when people move into a different place, asking them where is your home or what is home could be a very unsettling question because it brings ideas of belonging, ideas of identity, and people may feel finally out of place. One, a local asks, where are you come from? Because of the accent or because of many reasons because of your physical appearance or whatever the case. This question has been addressed in a long, yes, a scholarship about home and migration, but as I mentioned in my introduction, only a minor fraction of the literature really talk um, about life histories and give the narratives of the people, the main stamps in, the, in their projects. So in chapter two, One Essential Home um, by Paolo Bocagni, he engaged with um, Miriam, a person who has been doing, Paolo has been doing research with that person for over 10 years. And in this chapter is an invitation to look at different scales of home, looking at different ways in which people understand home, from the house, the dwelling, and also this idea of the people that made you feel at home. In short, the life history of Miriam tells us how she had been moving between Ecuador and Peru, living for many years in Italy. And although she has a very special attachment to his, her community of origin back in Ecuador, she only sees home where she is with her mother. So all the materiality of the house, the physical space is significant, is important, but when she is not with her mother, is probably not a home, only becoming a dwelling. In chapter three, which uh, I already mentioned the title, Sarah is engaged with the life history of Priya, a 32 years old in the woman living in Amsterdam. And this is a very interesting piece because we often take for granted, as for example, Professor Gazan Hash uh, made the case in 1997 when talking about how people with high skill do navigate between different places and feel at home. Priya, this is not necessarily the case. She also struggled to find a place to call home. And rather than really engaging with the local community, because she feels some kind of distant being, an Asian woman, well-prepared, well-educated, but navigating all these complexities, she decides to embrace the uh, Indian diaspora and trying to engage with her culture, with the way she decorates her physical space and all this stuff to remember us a kind of the feeling of being at home. And in chapter one, we by the hand of God, I engaged with a Peruvian uh, religious minister who wanted to move to a place where he can find people professing different community, different faiths to help them, as he said, to embrace their Christian values. And he wanted really to reach Muslim communities and eventually move to Manchester, where there is a significant Muslim community. And with this life story, I am trying to show how the issue of moving because of faith-related mobility can really um, question the boundary between the so-called force and voluntary migration. In this process, people can feel perhaps that they are voluntarily moving because they want to share the values of their faith, but at the same time, they are navigating some constraints because the community of faith has expectations. As in the case of Lucho, he moved 
be, with the support of the um, faith community. They, for example, apply for um, the, the visa, then for the citizenship, buy the house for he and his family. And when I asked him where is home, he said, home is a journey. Home is a journey with God. If you travel with God and family, you don't need to be concerned about home. This very idea, it may feel that the home for Lucho is a kind of an spiritual space as far as he is traveling with family and with God. But interestingly, he and his work with the faith community in Manchester is trying, or the main task of this faith community is trying to help uh, refugees and asylum seekers to find a home in Manchester. He said, refugees have lost everything. They don't have a home. So as a family and as a community, we want to make our home their home. All of them are welcome to our house. Our aim is to help them to find a home. By reading and studying the Bible together, we aspire to help them to feel at home. So somehow he sees his home, his own home and his family home as a very mobile space, but the home for refugees and asylum seekers rooted in Manchester. So, I asked um, Lucho, he, what is next, for example, where is his future home? And he just shared this piece of that, uh, that I want to read with you. I am like a fish. I was in Peru and felt like I was swimming in a pond only with people from my culture speaking my own language. Then I saw a hole and experienced fear. However, I crossed it and started swimming in a river. Once in the river, I discovered new animals that I found more fascinating, and then I arrived at the ocean. I feel that I am swimming in the ocean in Manchester because I see so many colors and so many animals that I didn't know while swimming in the pond. In Manchester, I interact with people from different cultures, different faiths, and communicate in different languages. Going back to Peru would be like moving from the ocean to the pond. What is the point of this long quotation? He has a very strong attachment to Peru, but he feels that in Manchester, he had been had the possibility to embrace different communities and share what he wants to share, the Christian values. So going back to Peru, when most of the people are believing in the same faith or engaged in the same faith, could be a missing opportunity. So navigating between this emotional and spiritual space could be the way he finds to share a uh, home with God and with the family. So um, over to you, Sarah, for the second part of the book. Of course. So the second part of the book is titled Struggles at Home. And to a certain extent, all life histories you're containing the whole book. So the nine of them are actually, you know, replenished with struggles. But we specifically focused on three life stories here, which were selected on the basis of uh, um, of experiences of migration, of forced migration, and of, uh, as our friends and co-authors, Aurora Massa and Milena Belloni uh, uh, framed, they are actually stories of uh, accumulated homelessness and or, uh, you know, somehow stories of individual and collective trauma, which, uh, which do happen to, uh, to become recountable through, uh, through the life story method. And I'm just going very briefly on, um, on the three stories of uh, uh, here contained. The first one, which is authored by Milena Belloni, is a story of Aaron. And Aaron is an Eritrean man who's been living for the past, I think, about five years in, in the Netherlands. Uh, Perhaps the most um, compelling part of Aaron's story is how he tried to a certain extent to open up uh, once he found uh, once he found the, the chance uh, when he uh, when he somehow stayed put in Amsterdam to, uh, to find some co-ethnics with whom to open up uh, and you know a, an association um a sort of voluntary association for for people to to exchange advice uh, to exchange practical advice but also at the same time to exchange in in fact life stories uh, it is the very time when uh, when Aaron can somehow feel that his struggles at home are still on the move but at the same time they uh, they find some still waters and it's really interesting because if you go through Aaron's life story you can see I mean 
um, the stories recounted by um, Aurora and Milena in particular were were concerned with people who moved uh, from uh, from the Horn of Africa, but all of them, uh, in spite of a certain commonality of trajectories, all of them have very very specific and peculiar life stories, individual uh, biographies. The second one, which is co-authored, and this is another issue that most of life stories here in the book are single authored so each one of us had a specific and peculiar relationship with the informants but in chapter five a story of accumulated homelessness and Mateus an Eritrean refugee in Rome the story of Mateus was curiously um, collected and uh, literally um, I mean registered both by Aurora and Milena at different times uh, over the course of a couple of years. And uh, um, Mateus in particular was uh, um, was part of uh, uh, a sort of eviction which took place um, you know, late in 2015, 2017 in, in Rome, and which was to a certain extent topical of a certain, um, let me say, uh, of a certain attitude of uh, uh, Italian police and of Italian public and political life at the time. And it is an, a really excellent example of how individual stories uh, uh, can somehow account for collective memories, can somehow account also for political struggles. And when we talk of struggles at home, we must, you know, also and always remember that we're not only talking about private domestic spaces but also and most importantly different of public spaces and i'm talking about neighborhoods but i'm also talking about cities and uh, you know states and nations indeed and i would like then to give back very briefly the, uh, the floor to Luis eduardo because uh, chapter six which is um an account of uh, of yolanda life stories and uh, yolanda is a Peruvian care worker. She was, um, I think there's a word missing there. The, the title, the full title of the chapter is a Peruvian care worker on the Spanish front line. And it's very interesting also because through this uh, life story, we sort of cut through into the contemporary time. Uh, um, Yolanda was working as a nurse uh, right during the time when COVID struck. So uh, I would be very much pleased if Luis Eduardo would like to to quote some of uh, Yolanda's um, own words. Yes, uh, thank you, Sara. Um, as Sara already mentioned, this is the very um, fascinating experience of a woman who had been living in Spain for many years, and she works in double shifts at the very beginning of the day, looking after the elderly, and at the end of the day, looking for neonates who are really struggling to live. So at the end, she had been in Spain, in, in Spain all this year, trying to support it, people who had been really struggling uh, for medical issues. But at the same time, Yolanda had been using this experience to create connections within the community with people in the hospital and in general in Madrid to try to transform this place as a home. So the overarching argument of this piece is that how K-workers can use it strategically the network they create with patients and with colleagues to transform the settlement of the place they are living into a home. This is also a very interesting piece of how people in the context of the COVID-19 navigate social and practices to try to clean themselves to the virus and to one extent people can feel isolated in their own domestic space. Just to share a little bit, because Yolanda was um, working in the hospital at the time of the COVID and many of the patients were dying, so her family just became afraid or sharing time with her or just giving a, a hug when she went back afterwards. So she felt so isolated, living in the same flat, in the same space, and it completely changed her experience of home in the very uh, place she had been living for many years. So this is an invitation to look at how the so-called um, just short distance mobilities within the same flat, just moving into a room, can completely change the experience of being with your family and feel just experiencing the lack of home in a place that you are already familiar, you had a sense of place just because something happened. This is, of course, massive at the COVID-19 pandemic. So I don't know, Sarah, you want to say something yeah, more about this? I just place? wanted to, to close a little bit on this part two of the book. And I wanted to say, first of all, that part two of the book gave us the chance to reflect on our 
sort of strive to balance uh, genders, to balance, uh, uh, you know, different groups of reference uh, as all authors within the, the homing project were actually dealing and working with different um, groups of people on the move uh, when we don't want to say migrants or we try to to encompass very different experiences of mobilities from uh, across the globe and our intent was also to do some uh, at least ideally some so-called lateral comparisons so we were trying to to compare life stories i mean we do not explicitly uh, wrote, write a, a treatise on how we could compare the life stories we collected but at the same time our intent also in grouping them in three different strands was trying to see how life stories were specifically peculiar but at the same time somehow they could even talk one to each other they could expand our own knowledge of how trying to to move across the globe or how trying to uh, search for one's new home struggling for making a new home or for retaining a former one and how and now we're moving to the the final part and how the taste is of our home both in material and symbolic and in emotional terms uh, were important to to be focused upon and to be ideally compared one laterally to each other so please luis eduardo will move first to the third part of the thank book. you sarah so as sarah already mentioned the third part is tastes of home and this uh, chapter also have an introduction and three chapters and it provides three examples of the potential and limitations of migrants food practices in their attempts to make a home in the transnational space so our argument is that by preparing food sharing food serving food people may feel attached to a particular place bringing memories of their five homes and perhaps those memories can feel the a little bit at home or really away from home. In that sense, we call with these um, three narratives of not romanticizing the idea of food practices and home. Food practices can be something that help people to find a place in the city, for example, sharing food with the neighborhoods and just getting to know each other. And of course, when, for example, people create business and ethnic restaurants, the so-called ethnic restaurants and ethnic markets are welcome because it's a diverse city to the landscape of food, but at the same time, as Sarah von Fanti highlighted in a paper in 2020, um, food can also may lead to a segregation and exclusion because food and people can be also unwelcome because of the, the flavors, because of the taste when people taste us is nice or disgusting, or also just because of the smell when you are cooking your food, other people may find this, oh, this is not good or the way you eat food, using cutlery or your hands, all these aspects matters in the way people may feel experience home or not. In chapter seven, Aurora Massa provides a very interesting narrative uh, of Magda, a woman who had been living in many places. Uh, in most of her life, she had been abroad and she had been inspired by the cooking of her mother and trying to recreate those recipes, first of all in New York and now in London. And with this experience, she has highlighted, I mean Magda, that cooking Eritrean food in London is not only about cooking and sharing food practices. This is also about questioning colonial practices and also engaging people with the way Black people in Eritrea eat and serve food in everyday life. Now, the second life history is this fascinating history of Suman. Over to you, Sarah, for sharing whatever you want about Suman. Yeah, I'd love to. So actually, uh, Suman gave me the chance to uh, to recollect not only the, his own life stories, the man, I mean, he's a chef coming from Kashmir and it's been like an internal displaced person uh, in his own home country uh, at a younger age. And then through the means of cooking, as used literally as, uh, as a profession, but also as a means of making oneself more mobile of getting the chance to move out to to emigrate from uh, from india and moving forth uh, uh, towards europe uh, i mean the mastery of cooking was something that it really he really held in high esteem and he was held in such high esteem by his own family and the story of sumanth if any of you might have the chance to read it it's a story of love for food uh, love for food which is um 
as Luis Eduardo already um, mentioned, a way of reproducing literally the tastes of one home, uh, one lost home in a new home, in a new place uh, uh, where to find oneself uh, in, in a state of comfort, in a state of, um, let me say, um, somehow, uh, literally family with uh, with the surrounding environment and actually the story of Sumant was specifically um, you know tender to me since I was at his own home uh, himself and his wife and the two the two girls they had I was their own uh, guest for quite a few uh, for quite a few times so to me the story of Sumant is a story of you know tastes of home which are not only reproducing uh, a story of a of a place of a homeland which has been left behind, but also a story where to reproduce one's own family cycle and possibly project it forth, project it otherwise. Even to, um, I mean, if you think the fact that Suman was not cooking himself at home in his own private domestic space, but it was actually um, somehow dictating the rhythm of cooking uh, to his own wife uh, at home, while uh, he, he was expressing his culinary art in the really super fancy and glitty restaurant he worked at uh, at Banks in, uh, in London. Uh, it's a way of seeing how much the power of life stories is, is, is really intertwined with practices like daily practices but also with politics and this is something that uh, we we'll try to to recognize a theme we'll try to recognize uh, discussing the, the end of the book so now it's time for me to talk about the last chapter of the book is chapter nine and to the story of Paola, an Ecuadorian woman with a Spanish passport who had been living in Manchester since 2015, I explore the intimate connection between food, mobility, and home. Uh, Paola used the, uh, her cooking just to try to find a place in the city. At the very beginning, she struggled with the language. Uh, she only knows that she mentioned that somehow during the first interview that she only knows the word um, thank you and welcome. And in that way, it was very difficult for her to engage with the city. So throughout the food practice, she tried to recreate the home feeling she had back in Ecuador and in Spain with her family. And this is part of what she said about this particular bit. I want my children to learn about my culture and food certainly says a lot about one's culture. They were born in Spain and are keen to eat Spanish tapas and omelets, but they have been raised with Ecuadorian food and love it. Food helped me to pass Ecuadorian culture on to my children. What is also interesting in this case is that Paola had been also using her cooking practices to create a community amongst Ecuadorians, in particular Ecuadorian students living in Manchester and around Manchester in, in England. So by cooking and selling Ecuadorian food in public places, she started to become familiar with the city and gained a, a, somehow a sense of community. This process began when Paola advertised her food on social media, and now I am read part of the history. My grandmother used to cook tamale, a dish of seasoned pork, chicken and maize, flowers steamed in plantain leaves, and ceviche. I inherited the recipes from her, and every time I cook them, I think about her. I cook these recipes for my family and to sell. You can imagine the incredible positive reactions of those Ecuadorians who buy my food. I cook, serve, and bought the food to be delivered by myself. Before leaving my house, I take pictures of the food and send them to my customers. I like to think about their excitement for our food all the way to their homes. Then, when I see their faces, I see that all my effort has paid off. The profits are low, but I found the whole process incredibly rewarding. The other day, a customer told me, your ceviche is the best ceviche in the world. That is what all this is about. And then we're just talking with Paola about what is the meaning of just cooking Ecuadorian recipes. And to my surprise, she was saying that spontaneously, as you can read here, I don't see myself as a patriotic person. However, I realized that since I start to cook and sell Ecuadorian food abroad, I have been instinctively displaying the dishes next to the Ecuadorian flag. I see my food and the colors of the Ecuadorian flag go well with together. 
The fact that I have been doing this for years made me think that I am probably more patriotic than I initially thought. When cooking, I often remember a popular Ecuadorian song called To My Beautiful Ecuador, something like My Lindo Ecuador in Spanish. The lyric says, wherever I am, I am Ecuadorian. If I think about myself, Paola said, the lyric should say, wherever I am, I cook Ecuadorian food. That is my way to say I am Ecuadorian. Yes, by cooking and selling our traditional recipes abroad, I express love for my country and how proud Proud, sorry, I am to be Ecuadorian. Food is like a patriotic symbol and I see my food as an expression of patriotism. What are the key messages of these uh, three life histories? The chapter illustrates further how the taste and smell the food and all the practices around have the power to connect memories and practices of home across multiple places, across the transnational space, for migrants to feel simultaneously experiencing home in a grounded place, perhaps in their country's origin, but also um, being mobile in the places they are living at the moment. Finally, I want to highlight how back in Eritrea, India and Ecuador, where our participants for this chapter come from, the food or the recipe that had been inspiring their food cooking and their practices abroad may be so special, somehow exotic in cities like Manchester in London, but back to these places that could be like ordinary cooking, everyday food, they provide well, the, all the means. In a nutshell, the, a single piece of bread shared with family members in the place left behind could be kind of bitter food, somehow remain resembling home, but at the same time saying, I am no longer there. My family is not here with me. So the tastes are not necessarily always sweet. Uh, thank you very much uh, for this conversation. And Sarah, over to you. Yeah, so this is very the last trend of our, um, of our presentation today. And just like Luis Eduardo mentioned that we had quite a few problems in finding a publisher, we also experienced the same tussles in trying to find someone who was keen on writing an afterword for our book. Uh, I would say that to a certain extent, our book was considered somehow piping hot, so it was like too complex and at the same time uh, somehow too nuanced to be um, to be easily um, to be easily afterwarded. And then in the end, we found. Russell King, whom many of you I'm sure know, who's a geographer or was perhaps a geographer at Suffolk, and he wrote an incredibly powerful and poignant afterword for us. Uh, first of all, the title of it says it all, so home as a trope of inequality, and I would try to, to stress the importance of inequality as intended in an intersectional lens as um, really a bundle of inequalities of multiple uh, differences and uh, instances of uh, you know hierarchies and uh, diversities which can be specifically um, you know difficult to navigate for people and i would also like i'm somehow i've always been fascinated by uh, etymology home of my life and if you think about the um, the meaning I, I mean the basic meaning of trope uh, trope is at the same time a locus in uh, I mean in Latin so a place but also a space for thought and for imagination and possibly for political mobilization so I would also like to mention that if you read this really short but as I said you know really powerful and succinct uh, uh, afterward by, by Russell King is it does start with the breaking out of war in um, in new Ukraine so uh, just consider that actually our book came out in 2023 but it was I mean it was ready already since 2022 and uh, at the time that Russell King wrote uh, uh, there was this sort of uh, really dramatic hype uh, across the across Europe I would say and um, specifically so he tried to focus on how home on how and I'm quoting myself here here on how this sort of new mobility regime of despair of you know internally displaced people of uh, uh, wartime zones and also of uh, I mean if you think about what what is happening is that today um, in the in the, far, in the past couple of months in uh, in the Israel and Palestine uh, border you could really see how the politics of domesticating one's own territory or trying to domesticate other people's territory is in fact a policy of 
necropolitics somehow of a politics of you know inflicting uh, um, inflicting violence inflicting potentially death uh, on on the homes of in, of entire populations so uh, if you go through the afterworld by russell king you will also have the chance to see how you know, life stories, which can be to a certain extent also considered, also seen as relatively shallow, like the ones that we tried to recount, are instead pretty much replenished uh, uh, with what I call mobility regimes of despair in different time zones and in different places of the world. Last but not least, and we'll go back to what we said at the beginning in explaining our theory of oral history accounts, um, Russell King does um, a wonderful um, a wonderful recollection of the politics of representativity. And I'm saying that specifically um, speaking of life stories, life stories are at the same time a politics of writing and also a politics of writing. So um, there is a critical um, discourse also in using oral history as a means of representation for social groups for people on the move uh, but all in all uh, uh, for for any one of us uh, who tries to uh, to make oneself understood through the means of recounting their own life experience and again uh, i would like to to just spend one more word on the importance of uh, the care and respect we did have for our interlocutors are also something that emerges from our consideration of the importance of being, of, el of holding ourselves accountable for speaking on behalf of others. And I'm, of course, I would like to quote here Gayatri Spivak and all the subaltern studies movement, but uh, I'm not only talk talking about, uh, you know, my own, uh, you know, South Asian diaspora, uh, of course, in four months and interlocutors and tellers, but I'm also talking about all the people we had the wonderful chance, the wonderful gift to, to be able to encounter, to be able to share wonderful relationship with, wonderful, and at, at the same time, some, you know, many times also um, uh, tense, and uh, from this tension, I do think that the collection of life story is at the same time, uh, you know, a witness, but also uh, it may propel further reflection from all of us, from the readership as well. So thank you all for listening.